Hi everybody, it's Kyosin and Leslie. And I know that everybody's going through a pretty difficult time right now. Um, things are changing very, very fast for us. Um, a lot of you may not be going to graduation, may not be going to prom, may not be seeing your friends. Um, and there's a lot of worries right now for all of us about work and the economy and our future, what that's gonna look like. Um, things are kind of scary. Um, and it's, it's rough to not have martial arts in person right now to relieve stress and see each other and visit with our friends. And what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about another difficult time in history. And that is the time in which Wang Pi grew up um, and became an adult and studied martial arts and eventually founded the Mudaquan and made the martial arts that we study today, uh, specifically Tang Soo Do. Um, and I hope that this gives you a little perspective on how difficult times really were for him and how hard he had to work to learn martial arts and to make a successful martial arts survive out of everything that happened in Korea during the time when he was growing up from um, a kid to his 40s. Um, and uh, how amazing it is that he was successful. And not just that that was a really difficult time or that there was bad guys, but that we can learn from it and that we can persevere and keep martial arts alive, even if we have to do it over Zoom calls, even if we have to do it through self-study on our own time, because Winky had to do a lot of self-study and had, there were no schools available to him for him to go to for a long time for other reasons, different than the pandemic we face today. So uh, let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about Winky, Grandmaster Winky. So, um, he was born on November 9th, 1914, um, and he was born in a town in Korea that is now where the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, is between North and South Korea. Um, so the town's not there anymore, um, unfortunately. And he was born at in interesting times in Korea. Um, so um, up until the late 19th century, that's the 1800s, Korea was an empire, um, both North and South Korea together. They had an emperor and an empress, and uh, they, they had had dynasties for a very, 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 very long time. And in the 1870s, Japan was becoming a more and more powerful country, and they had more and more political and trade influence on Korea all the time. And in 1876, there was a, a treaty established between Japan and, and Korea. And uh, it uh, opened up Korea to Japanese trade, but it did it at a cost. Um, it meant that uh, there was a lot more economic and political influence from Korea, uh, from Japan onto Korea. And at, forced, it, at first, it was just forcing changes in trade and how Korea did business with the world and how they, their trends and their culture, but it got more and more drastic as time went on. Um, there um, was still a, a queen, Queen Min, um, in Korea, and in uh, 1895, she was assassinated by Japanese agents. So imagine living in a country and all of a sudden you find out your leader who is is part of a, a long-standing dynasty has been assassinated by another country um and there were revolts and protests um democracy protests uh people tried to reestablish the korean empire and they even went as far as going to the hague um the korean representatives went to the hague and pled for help um in the end, they were unsuccessful. In 1910, in May of 1910, um, Japan formally annexed Korea. And what does that mean? What does annexing mean? It means that um, Korea became a property, a, a part of Japan. So Japan was in charge. They appointed uh, leadership over Korea. Um, there was no longer an emperor and empress. Um, and they had lots and lots of control over every part of life in Korea. So. They, can, they sent their own police officers to be police in, in local towns and cities across Korea. Um, they were in charge of the education system. They decided whether kids learn Korean language or Japanese writing or a mixture of both, which was sometimes the case. 
Um, a lot of like museum artifacts from Korea were seized and sent to Japan. Um, and uh, there was a kind of a military police structure in charge of the country. Um, they controlled the media, they controlled newspapers um, and reporters, and uh, they, they kind of had ultimate control over every part of daily life in Korea. But uh, life went on. Uh, people still had to eat, they still had to go to work, they still had to live their daily lives. And this is the world that Kwon Jinim Wanki was, was born into. Um, because uh, this, this annexation again happened in 1910 and uh, he was born in 1914. So only four years after this had all happened. And this is the world that he grew up as a, as a kid and a teenager in. And uh, it does, again, as I said, it doesn't mean that life stopped in Korea. Um, he had parents, he had a life, he went to school. He actually did very, very well in school. It was rare to graduate from high school at the time under that regime, and uh, he did. Um, he was very, very intellectual and very clever. And uh, he still went to things like festivals and, and markets and things. And he had a, a at the time, there weren't martial arts schools. The Japanese government didn't allow that in, in territories that they occupied. Um, but people still practiced martial arts, you know, in private or at, at local festivals, things like that. And he saw people would be practicing martial arts like Taekyun and Sip Balki, of traditional Korean martial arts at festivals. And he was like, this is really neat. I want to learn it. But uh, there weren't just schools that you could go to then. Um, that wasn't a thing that was allowed. You, you couldn't just sign up, have your parents sign you up for martial arts classes. So he was so motivated, even as a young kid, that he would go to these people who were practicing and plead with them, please, please teach me. I want to learn. And they'd be like, you're a little kid. You can't come study martial arts. That's not a thing that we do. It's, it, we, we choose our apprentices carefully and we study in private. And he's really, really disappointed. He watched them and tried to learn things, but um, they, uh, they didn't let him practice formally, um, unfortunately. And he still kept that in the back of his mind, but he had to live his life. And he had to live under this, this difficult set of circumstances, which was his country was occupied by Japan and they made the rules. And um, ultimately, if you wanted to be a successful person, you had a few different options. You could you know, go to Japan or China or work and work, or you could work under the poor economy in Korea. And he ultimately made the decision to go work for the railroad in China because he was very smart. And that was kind of fortunate for him because he got a little bit more freedom to study martial arts as he was traveling through, for work through China. Um, so um, in 1936, he... Uh, met a Chinese master, Master Yang. Um, and uh, he went there with a friend and they didn't speak much Chinese, unfortunately. So they really couldn't have a nice conversation about martial arts. Um, but he, he had never forgotten that he really wanted to study martial arts. Um, and uh, so here he is like a, a, a young adult, um, uh, but not a kid. Um, so he goes to this, this house and he's like, I really want to study this. Um, but he couldn't really express what, that he wanted to study. Um, and, uh, the, the master was very, very kind about it. He was like, I'm not a professional teacher. I, I'm not good enough to teach you. And he didn't have enough Chinese to please plead his case with, with master Yang. Um, and he was very, very disappointed. Um, but he did take as much advantage as, of, as he could of the Chinese libraries while he was traveling. And he would find books on um, Chinese and other countries' martial arts and try to teach himself from those books. So um, here we have somebody who's, who's a little bit younger than me, not, not a kid. And he desperately wants to study martial arts, but there's no schools. And he doesn't speak the language in China where you can actually study martial arts if you're even accepted to study martial arts. Um, so he gets books and he starts reading the books and he starts like learning forms from, from stuff that's written down. There's no YouTube, there's no videos. He has to read pages and learn forms that way. Um, and some of them might not even be in Korean, some of them are in Chinese. Um, 
And so he reads all these books while he's traveling. He, he teaches himself all he can from a, a bunch of different sources, a bunch of different styles of martial arts. And eventually he goes back to Master Yang and he just pleads with him. He's like, I really, really want a, a teacher. I really want to study with a person instead of just reading books all the time. And uh, eventually Master Yang caves and uh, he takes on uh, five students. Um, you know, Quan Jinim, Wing Ki is one of them and uh, uh, four other students and they taught, they, he taught them some Chinese martial arts. So um, postures, conditioning, um, steps, forms, combat applications, but he was still an adult and he was still working and we still have this, this difficult situation at the time. This is the 1930s. Um, it's the Great Depression too, which means times are tough um, economically. And for a lot of different reasons, he ends up having to go back to Korea and leave his studies behind. Um, and uh, he would try to get back to Korea when he, he would try to get back to China to study with Master Yang when he could, but it was, it was very difficult. And things were changing in China too. So all these things are happening politically in the world. It was very, a very difficult time for a lot of countries, not just America, not just Europe, um, prior to World War II and at the beginning of World War II. Um, so China was headed towards becoming a communist state, uh, which banned uh, traditional martial arts. And uh, so eventually, once things went that direction, he could never go back to see Master Yang again. Um, or even write in letters. Um, so at this point, he's, he's learned a lot about martial arts. He studied for several, uh, several years with Master Yang, and uh, he's been reading all these books on martial arts um, from, from all around Asia. And he decided at that point, well, maybe I could teach somebody um, someday, because I, I kind of know enough now that I'm at the level where I could teach some beginners. But um, at that time, again, Japan was still occupying Korea and things were going downhill because of the Great Depression and World War II was, was on the horizon. Things, tensions were escalating all over the world. And uh, there was only two martial arts that the Japanese allowed and uh, they were Kendo and Judo. Um, if you wanted to study a martial art, the Japanese would allow you to study one of those. And um, you couldn't study Chinese martial arts, really. They were pretty much unknown. Um, Okinawan karate, again, um, was just starting to become a little bit more well-known in, in Japan, um, but not in Korea yet. Um, so he didn't really want to try to get a Japanese instructor to teach him kendo or judo. Um, that was difficult for a number of reasons. Again, these are the people who are, have taken over his country. Um, and no matter if, whether they're nice martial artists or not, that was, that was pretty difficult politically. Um, and uh, he just couldn't figure out how to make this happen. He wanted to teach people, but it was pretty much illegal for him to start a school. And uh, he, um, he couldn't uh, take on students without putting them at risk and without putting himself at, at risk for arrest or fines. And uh, of course, there was also a lot of economic troubles at the time. Again, we're in the Great Depression. Um, nobody has a lot of money. And he's also in an occupied country, which makes it even worse. Um, and he still kept working for railways. Um, he was very, very smart. Um, and. Uh, he could still exercise and uh, practice on his own. Um, and uh, he started reading about Okinawan karate, which he found very, very interesting. Um, now, of course, people like uh, Gaichin Funakoshi have made it more popular in Japan. So the books start coming over to Korea, even though there's not like teachers coming over he can study with. But he's in the library in Seoul, and he, he spends a lot of time reading about Okinawan karate, and he finds it very interesting. Um, and uh, it was uh, like a modern martial art. Uh, this was the first time he was seeing something like the format that we're used to, which is like uh, a, a organized curriculum and um, a modern martial art that's studied in, in a classroom format. Um, so he thinks that's really cool. He's like, I can do a lot with this. This, this Okinawan karate thing 
is really, really interesting that it's becoming popular in Japan. Um, but he could only study via books. He had to learn everything by reading books. And again, no YouTube, no martial arts on TV, no martial arts movies. Um, he no longer had access to, to his educator in, in China, really. He had to do it all through reading books. How tough is that? Um, but he, he's learning a lot still. And he picks up things like, like um, Okinawan forms that eventually became our Pyongans. Um, so he changes them a little bit to suit the Chinese martial arts style that he's learned. But they're still basically the Okinawan forms, the Okinawan karate forms. But his background and his training is more in Chinese martial arts. So he changes things like the hip motion and uh, hip extension and thrust on kicks. Um, so those are the things that are still really, really important to our style of Teng Sudo today um, over some Okinawan karate techniques that are still being practiced too. Um, and he was very fortunate because it was a difficult economic time and he's in this, this uh, restricted country, but he works for the railroad. So he can kind of travel around the country freely. That was very unusual at the time. Um, he could afford to do it because he worked for the, for the trains. Um, and he traveled all over and uh, to around China and around Korea and uh, tried to find more books and, and find more little tidbits about martial arts while he did it. Um, and then World War II happens. And I'm reading a lot about the history of the Mudokwan from Wang Ki's book, The History of the Mudokwan. And it's funny because there's, <laughs> There's one paragraph about World War II. It's like, and then World War II happened. But what, what, what did World War II mean for Korea? Well, things got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot worse in, in Korea. Um, a lot of people got conscripted. So if you were a young man or a young woman, you would have a very high likelihood of getting conscripted, conscripted into service by the Japanese military to do all kinds of different awful things. Um, and uh, the economy was doing badly. Uh, Japan was putting all its resources towards war. Um, and uh, yeah, things were, things were not good uh, for the Korean people. Um, they were used for science experiments. It, it's just really awful things. And um, yeah, uh, there was forced labor. There was um, almost a million Korean Koreans conscripted to go to Japan to help them in the war effort. Um, so that meant they didn't have a choice um, or they had limited choice to survive. Um, they had to do it if they wanted to eat. Um, yeah, so origin it started out as here, here's some way to make a little money and then it became directly like you have to go work in Japan now even though it's dangerous, even though they're at war. So really, really scary stuff. Um, yeah, and the work that they had to do was super dangerous because it was wartime and they had to work fast for almost no money with no safety, um, and, uh, really scary times for Korea that, um, Wang Yi doesn't really talk about in his book, um, for probably a lot of reasons. Um, but that was the world that they, they had to, he had to keep studying martial arts in. And he was fortunate because he was an educated person who had a stable job. Um, and, uh, he was able to keep studying and stay safe, but at the mean, while that's happening, he has to watch all this stuff happening to his country and the, the people around him. Um, things were really pretty dire. Um, but, um, fortunately for, um, Wang Ki and for the Korean people, um, at the end of World War II, in uh, 1945, um, Korea became an independent country. Uh, Japan had been conquered, basically. They had been defeated in war, um, and uh, they, they were being occupied by American troops, and obviously Japan couldn't occupy another country at the same time, so Korea became an independent country um, through terrible circumstances of war and a lot of people dying. And so that's 1945, and all of a sudden, here we are. Um, things are starting over. 
the Korean people have to figure out how to start their lives and their country over. Um, and they didn't know what, what was going to happen next, I'm sure. Um, all of a sudden, after ha half a century, people's whole lifetimes of being occupied J by Japan, they were suddenly a, a free country again. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of people had died. A lot of people had suffered horribly. Um, the economy was in bad shape and uh, they had to start over and build their own country. And that, that's a task I can't even imagine. They had to build their own government and their constitution and a military and figure out how they were gonna run their own education system. And at the same time, Wang Ki during that is like, hey, I can start martial arts schools now. Think about that, imagine that for a minute. So, so Wang Ki has just watched his country be occupied his entire life, his entire life from the time when he was born, they've been occupied by Japan and they've been repressed and the economy hasn't been great. And every aspect of life from living daily lives at a job to education to the media have all been controlled by Japan. And now his country's free and He's like, well, I can make lemonade out of these lemons. Uh, I can start teaching martial arts now. Um, and he quit his job and he started full-time teaching martial arts. Um, he had been studying martial arts at that point for about 25 years. And um, most of it was self-taught. Again, there was no schools. There were no Zoom sessions. All he had was books. There's no YouTube. There was no um, like internet guides to, to learning martial arts or even martial arts movies to watch. He did it all with books. Um, so he took all this stuff that he had learned from his Chinese teachers, like Master Yang, and these books about Okinawan karate from Japan. And his, some, he had some knowledge of Korean martial arts that he had seen um, practiced, especially when he was young. And he made martial art. Um, he uh, founded the Mudaquan on November 9th, so his birthday, in 1945. Um, so a few months also after Korea had become a free country. And uh, it's truly amazing. And that's when he, he started it out with the eight key concepts. Um, so the eight key concepts, of course, we can, we can all say them together. Courage, concentration, endurance, honesty, humility, control of power, tension and relaxation, and speed control. And he named it all the Mudaquan. He named his organization the Mudaquan, um, which is the Institute, Institute of Martial Virtue. Uh, um, so Mudaquan. Um, and yeah, this is where all these concepts that we memorize, like our 10 articles, uh, the, 10, the 10 creeds, the 10 articles of faith came from. This all came from the, this organization that he had formed in his mind for years and years. Well, he wasn't even allowed to form a school. Well, all these terrible things were happening to his country. And you know, the really amazing thing is, you know, he found, he found a lot of friends who were, uh, wanted to study with him and eventually became officers in the Mudaquan and helped him form the organization. Um, and they, they started their own schools. Uh, when you become a second Don, you'll learn a little bit more about all these, these original schools that, he, that came from the Mudaquan. Um, and uh, this all happened in 1945 to 1948, um, because in 1950, the Korean War started. Oh my gosh, you know, they, they haven't had enough problems, um, you know, being occupied and World War II and all the terrible things that happened to Korea then. They immediately got launched into another war in 1950, in June 25, 25th, 1950. Um, Korea splits in half. So there's, there's the, the South Korea that's kind of backed and supported by the Western world and America. And then there's North Korea that's backed by, uh, like by Russia and China. Um, and yeah, uh, five million people die, um, civilians and military people both. Um, it's a horrendous war with a ton of casualties and it splits Korea permanently in half. Um, and technically, South Korea and North Korea are still at war. Um, there is a DMZ that is a strip of land between the two countries, and nobody can go across it without authorization. It's just there's no towns there, there is no houses there, 
there's no farms there. It's just this strip of land that nobody can cross and the two countries are still divided. Um, thankfully, they are, they are no longer at, at active war, um, but there's always concerns that, you know, somebody will, will launch a rocket to prove that they can or have a military exercise and things will escalate and we'll worry that we get to the point where there's going to be an escalation of war again. Um, and then some peace actions are taken and things get a little bit better for a while and just uh, things improve. Um, we've been going back and forth that between, between North and South Korea. We've been going back and forth like that for um, 70 years now, um, you know, um, since, since this, this war began in 1950. Um, it's pretty wild to think about a war lasting for 70 years. Um, but yeah, uh, this, this was another huge hit to martial arts in Korea and to the Mudokwan because, you know, I, I just mentioned he, um, Wang Ki had trained some people and he had had some, some students start their own schools um, between 1945 at the end of World War II and 1950 at the um, start of the Korean War. And of course, in the Korean War, a bunch of people had to go to war again. They had become soldiers and a bunch of his students died um, and their schools collapsed um, during the Korean War. But despite all of this, despite all these catastrophic things that happened um, between the other martial artists who had started organizations, um, alongside the Mudokwan and, uh, you know, the uh, Wang Ki's own students, um, the Mudokwan managed to survive. It's obviously still here today. Um, uh, we are still studying the art of Tang Soo Do in the Mudokwan style. Um, we're still practicing forms that um, Grandmaster Wang Ki developed. Um, we're still practicing techniques in the same way. Um, and we're still practicing with under Grandmaster um, C.I. Kim, who's one of the original uh, practitioners of, of Tang Soo Do. And we're incredibly fortunate to be able to do that. Because think about all the things I've told you for the last half hour, all the, the trials and tribulations that Wang Ki had to go through. Um, and this organization has survived all that. Um, he managed to study and sustain martial arts through an occupation and through two wars, um, through, a, through the Great Depression. Um, he did that all because he loved martial arts. He kept Tang Soo Do alive because he loved martial arts. And he kept Korean martial arts alive because he loved martial arts. Even when that meant just reading books to study, even that when that meant he wasn't allowed to run classes or allowed to start a school, even that when that meant he had to go to other countries to study martial arts he managed to keep martial arts alive. And as we're facing these unprecedented times right now um, with a pandemic and economic problems in our own country and across the whole world, it's our responsibility to be that brave and keep martial arts alive. We have so many tools that Wang Ki didn't have that his contemporaries um, who had studied, who started the original five schools um, after World War II didn't have. We have the internet. We have YouTube, we have Zoom. We can see each other and practice over video connections. We can share ideas over chat apps. We can educate each other with books. We still have those resources. And even if this has to go on for a while and we have to change the way that we do things, I think that all of us have a responsibility to keep the martial arts alive, no matter what that looks like. And we have to be adaptable. Um, Wanky was incredibly adaptable. He, you know, managed to study martial arts as an adult while he was working for a railroad and traveling all over the place, even when he wasn't allowed to practice martial arts at home, even when he had to learn from books and in the library. He managed to keep studying martial arts, and that's so important. Um, and uh, I hope this, this little lecture has been useful to all of you, um, and you've learned something. And uh, I'm happy to answer more questions about the material, but... I hope this has inspired you to, even if this is months or a year and things have to change in the way that we study martial arts for a while, we're still martial artists, all of us. It's very, very important that we work to stay martial artists, keep our skills up, support each other, keep the martial arts alive because every martial arts school in the world right now is facing the same thing. Every single one from Korea to China to America to Europe, 
every martial arts school right now is struggling with the same problems. And if we don't fight to keep martial arts alive, then they'll be gone. So thank you all for all your time. And uh, I hope you have a safe and wonderful day and keep your spirits up because we're all martial artists and we're all in this together, Mudo. <laughs>